me tonight? I'm happy to. Okay. Awesome. Hi. Uh, it's so nice to see everyone and also a kind of a, a moving day to see everyone in that it's our last time together. So I just want to start by saying thank you to everyone who's been joining the seminar on and off since May, which at least in an in individual life is like an eternity and much has changed. And so, and also in the collective life and back into, I'm sure everyone else's individual collectives. Um, I just want to start by thanking Emmy O'Brien and Wendy Lauderman and Alex Colston and all of the facilitators who've stepped up to be part of this in a deep way, including Noor Asif, Michelle Rada, Patricia Ekpo, Alex Khan, uh, Cole Moore, Sarah Brulette, Sophie Lewis, Carlin Wing, Amy Wong, Abby Colchin, and Laura Shihai, uh, most of whom I think are able to join today, but not all, but still thank you to all of you who are here. And of course, to all the participants. Um, this has been incredibly moving as well as difficult material, and it's just been an honor to learn myself so much with all of you. Um, and uh, the magazine that is the result of much of the thinking that we've done here together, or result of some of the thinking, is now at the printer. Uh, so I'll just drop in the chat the announcement of issue one, The Family Problem. Um, and uh, as this is the, the coming to the end of our time together, at least centered around this theme, I just want to note that next year in 2023, we will have a seminar on the topic of repair, irreparability, and reparation across the psychosocial, um, which is also the issue theme for the second uh, edition of Parapraxis. Uh, and we will hope to see you all back here then if, if you feel like joining. And all of that said, I want to move quickly out of the way to say it is my absolute honor and pleasure to introduce my friend and beloved colleague, uh, Dr. Palomi Saha, uh, who will be speaking to us today about Hortense Spiller's work as our final moment in the seminar. Dr. Saha is an associate professor of English and on the executive committee of the program in critical theory at UC Berkeley, where they work across the fields of post-colonial studies, ethnic American literature, and critical theory. Their first book, An Empire of Touch, Women's Political Labor, and the Fabrication of East Bengal, which came out in 2019 from Columbia University Press, I'll drop that link in, in the chat in a second, was awarded the Harry Levin Prize for the outstanding first book by the American Comparative Literature Association the following year in 2020. And they're also at work currently on a project that sounds so incredible. And I've heard little bits and pieces across the last few years that considers the cultish allure and scandal of so-called Indian spirituality in America. And um, it's just a dream to now get to learn from Palomi, and so I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Um, I can't tell you what an honor it is uh, to be here, uh, to get to be a part of the, the seminar. Um, I will echo the thanks uh, to everyone who makes this possible. I am really delighted and, um, you know, I frankly, I'm a little out of my depth, so I'm hoping that you will be gentle with me. Um, as we try and work through Hortense Spillers' 1996 uh, essay from Critical Inquiry, all the things you could be by now if Sigmund Freud's mother, sorry, Sigmund Freud's, what, Sigmund Freud's wife was your mother, and I will, I will have that pair practice over and over again. We can talk about that. Um, a longer version of the essay was published later in the same year, 1996, in Boundary 2. Um, and I'm going to begin by what I can only understand to be a psychoanalytic confession, which is that um, I texted Hannah about an hour ago with uh, a terror that we may have read different versions of the essay. Uh, or more worryingly, that I read the wrong version and all of you read the correct version, and I would have to speak to you across a gap uh, that would be on two different pages looking at some of the same words, but produced in a different order, uh, two linked but separate critical discourses. That is, I think my anxiety was invited by the essay itself. Um, but we have apparently read the same essay. Uh, my anxiety hasn't been lessened, but I'm going to proceed <laughs> nonetheless. Um, so this essay in some ways follows uh, from Spillers' groundbreaking 1987 
uh, Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, which I know that the seminar read uh, in the earlier stage. And here she begins with a scene of doubling, a memory of being a child in church, hearing an enjoyment to those who couldn't make it to perform as part of a choir at another congregation that they, quote, send go. In the mind of a young Spillers, that go who is sent was, quote, the mark of substitution, the translated inflections of self beyond the threshold of the fleshed natural girl. She actually imagines a double of herself scampering off. But the title of the essay that she tells us at the end actually comes from Charles Mingus's 1961 composition of the same name. Um, I'm actually going to play a few seconds of this, uh, and then we can chat about uh, the title and I think you might need to uh, click on share sound when sharing the oh. screen, if it's yeah. plain. You would think I would know how to do this. It's often in the corner on the share screen. It's a it's an option oh, available. Share sound. All right, let's try this again. Sorry. And now, ladies and gentlemen, you this one of all tonight. We have a special treat in store for you as a composition dedicated to all mothers and it's titled all the things you could be by now Sigmund Freud's wife was your mother which means Sigmund Freud's wife was your mother all the things you could be by now it means nothing you got it thank you one one two three <laughs> the whole song but um, it's a, an extraordinary composition um but the part i wanted to play and i hope you could hear some of it i'll read what mingus says he says and now ladies and gentlemen you've been such a wonderful audience we have a special treat in store for you this is a composition dedicated to all mothers it's and it's titled all the things you could be by now if sigmund freud's wife was your mother which means if sigmund freud's wife was your mother all the things you could be by now which means nothing. You got it? Thank you. It's, I can't imagine a more perfect uh, psychoanalytic introduction to uh, a composition. And I'd like for us to think about these, these two things as we uh, go forward. One, dedicated to all mothers. The question for me throughout this essay is where are the mothers? Um, what happens to the mother in this masterful account of the stuttering of Oedipal universality? And then, of course, the question of nothingness. Uh, when Mingus says, which means nothing, as an answer to his question, what means nothing? Is it that you could be nothing or that the title itself means nothing? Um, I'm not sure that we're supposed to answer this. Uh, Mingus actually re reportedly wrote the song in 1958 on his third day of a several week long hospitalization at Bellevue Psychiatric Hospital where he uh, checked himself in and was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. The song, which is a reinterpretation of Jerome Kern and Oscar Hammerstein's All the Things You Are, grammatically and ideologically reorients, is reoriented by Mingus with the, subjun the subjunctive, which is of course the mood, uh, the grammatical mood that expresses hopes, desires, and wishes. Lamar Bruce in his 2021 How to Go Mad Without Losing Your Mind offers an exquisite reading of the title, recalling as Spillers does, that by placing the relationship at stake as between you and your mother's father, Freud is here both potentially biological father, stepfather, or the per perhaps the person that has your mother's affections but has no necessary filial bond to you. Recall here then again, Mama's baby, Papa's maybe. Bruce, though, continues to insist 
that the maternal relation that Mingus highlights in his opening of the song tells us something else. And I'm gonna read uh, from uh, Bruce here. He writes, quote, but after all, what could you be now if Martha Freud was your mother? If you were white, male, and Sigmund's offspring, maybe you'd be heir to his vast epistemological estate, a primary beneficiary of modernity's most influential theories of subjectivity. But what if you were Black, end quote. This is, of course, the question at the heart of the Spiller's 1996 essay. Not only what could you be now if you were Black, um, and of course, the given here is the son, right? The Black son. If you were the owner, if you were the Black son of the owner of the vast epistemological estate, or if you were the illegitimate non-beneficiary of its theory of subjectivity. What Spiller suggests is radical in that it goes to the foundation of psychoanalytic theory as it is inherited from Freud. If, she asks, the Oedipal complex is universal in that it pertains to all societies, then how does an analyst who is enjoined to understand their patient and the totality of their life world through their words make sense of a patient for whom that structure of relation isn't given? That is the question, uh, that is, she asks the subject, sorry, that is, she asks then, who is the subject of treatment, right? If we have inherited a structure of the Oedipal complex in which the subject is both singular and in a particular relationship to the father, what happens to this new subject? So she takes up Sow's, uh, Sow and Ortiz um, uh, on two different versions of the African Oedipus, and she sort of shows non-progressive progressively and linearly, what a theory of subjectivity of the Black man might look like if his mother was Sigmund Freud's wife. Um, and so I thought I'd go through and sort of point out what are to me kind of eight central features of uh, Spiller's theory and the African life world with which the Sao, the Ortigs, and Spiller's is concerned um, as a way to sort of track what's happening. The first, she says that um, in this context, that is uh, the African context, there is no singular subject of mental illness. She writes on sev in 717, uh, the ma uh, madness is a mishap in the ensemble of sociocultural relations. So that's first. Second, whereas the Western subject, Freud's proper heir internalizes guilt as a sign of subjectivity, for the African subject, the guilty conscience is outside himself. This is because of three. The outside is a cosmosocial order divided into three parts. The first part is the given order of the social. The second is the world of the spirits, and the third is the realm of the ancestors. So four, then, the goal of therapy is Spillers writes, quote, bringing one back into harmonious relations with the cosmogonic principle whose intent can be teased out in various mythic narratives. The goal of therapy is a return, but not a return to the self, but rather a return to a harmonious relation between these three orders. Five, then, mythic narratives operate in a different but related economy to one's own speech and discourse, which is the substance of the talking cure. Six, psychological defenses are cultural and collective. The above, myth. Uh, seven, the subject that is authored is not simply from within, but split between a kind of becoming, which is what we think of as the potentiality of the subject, and another who sees the look of another. And eight, what this produces is a relation of deep horizontality because the symbolic function of the father is now tied to the ancestors. So in our classical Oedipal crisis, we have a social and intimate order in which you have a terror and love of the father and a love and rivalry between the brothers. This one is not resolved by a castration fear of the father or a rivalry of the brothers. Instead, 
Spiller says that it produces a kind of collective obedience and filiality between the brothers because they are now in relation to the law of the ancestors. So Spiller's, on the one hand, is producing a new narrative structure by which to think of the universality of uh, Oedipus, but I think that she's also doing something that is far more radical and expansive in that if we believe, as people invest in psychoanalysis, that our inherited cultural script of the Oedipal crisis is a kind of synecdoche for all of the other relations that exist. You can disagree. We can, you know, think about the limits, but yeah, you know, the family, society, the nation. And in this crisis, you must kill the father and enter into an impossible condition of rivalry. Spillers is saying that there is an Oedipal crisis in a different frame. And she says that this Oedipal crisis produces a social arrangement that has two crucial representations. One, the collective phallus, and two, the unbeatable ancestor. So what do we then do with our structure of Oedipus? If we have, if we have now a collective phallus rather than the individual castration fear, and to an unbeatable ancestor of a literally different realm rather than the material or even symbolic father, what do we make of this apparently universal crisis? For the race subject in America, which uh, for this essay is particularly the descendant of chattel slavery, this is complicated by having been given an inheritance that is being riven from the site of the ancestors, an incomplete but not impossible access to the mythic narratives that uphold the social structure. There is a fundamental discontinuity. So the questions that I might have for us uh, going forward, and I, I want to leave enough time for conversation because there's so much in this essay is, how do we then resolve this Oedipal crisis? What do, we, what do we do with this fundamental discontinuity that is at its heart? Um, what kind of social order is called into being? And I'll return us to this question of where is the mother? In both Freud's Oedipal crisis and in Spiller's, we have very quickly in the subjunctive mood done away with the mother and trained our eyes so intensely on her husband, that is Freud. So um, I'm happy to chat. Um, I, we can talk, we can turn to a couple of different sections, um, but uh, I will open it up from here and then we can, we can proceed. Thank you so much, Palomi. That was fantastic. Um, yeah, typically we take a couple questions before we break out. We'll we'll take a couple questions and have a five minute break and then move into small groups um, if if we have enough participants. So if people um, want to raise their hands or put questions in the chat, feel free. Um, Also, and people are welcome to just unmute themselves and 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 start talking. Oh, thank you, Palomi, for that really helpful um, framework and the eight points um, that you laid out. I was, um, this isn't really a question, but I was wondering if you, um, I think an important part of the essay is the Spiller's placing of race into the real, um, or her, uh, it seem, that seems like a pretty, um, novel contribution of, of the paper. Um, and I was wondering if you would say more about that or expound on um, your thoughts on that, on that aspect of it. Yeah, that's great. Why don't, let's do this old school pedagogical style. Let's turn to the page. Um, and uh, Spillers begins this um, on 712. So about halfway down that big paragraph, um, 
uh, as she's talking about potentiality, she says, uh, but the resonance that I would rely on here is less dependent on a narrative genealogy whose plot point cultivates an epiphany of triumph than on the different relation to the real, where I would situate the politics and the reality of race. Um, even though it is fairly clear that race can be inflected and should be through Lacanian dimensions, its face as an aspect of the real brings to light its most persistent per perversity, right? And then she has this reading of uh, Mikhail Borsch Jacobson where uh, the real is pure and simple. And she says, and I think that this is such an extraordinary thing, that in the classic theories of, psycho of psychoanalysis, there is a there is a kind of freezing of subjectivity, right? Um, and the overcoming of that is a cancellation of the given. So she says, uh, Michael Jacobson offers the explanation, thus the language, the manifestation of the negativity of the subject who posits himself by negating himself as the real works the miracle of manifesting what is not. So, this structure of the real suggests one, a, uh, a givenness where speaking is an uh, opening of a space for presence and uh, absence registers presence as much as presence re registers absence. But this idea of the potentiality of the subject as a place of becoming is the thing to which she wants to return, right? She begins with the scene of doubling. Um, and then suggest that the double does a kind of work that does not, um, it doesn't compensate, right, for the question of lack, but it does a particular kind of work. So I think that the question I might turn to all of you is what is the work then of the doubling? What work does doubling as Spillers uh, lays it out, do for this question of lack and the real. I don't have a, a an answer to that particular question, although I think it'll be useful to keep in mind during small groups. But um, uh, I have a, another question, if it's if that is okay. Um, and it kind of belongs to the same page if if we're like looking at um, specific passages, um, but it has to do with, I guess, thinking back to Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, and the if there is to be any kind of like call, um, even if there's not a, a kind of um, thesis posited about or 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 any kind of like prescription or or suggestion of of where to go after that essay there is this kind of um implicit call for for the capacity to recognize a new social subject whether that um whether we arrive there through language or otherwise and it seems like similarly in this essay there's a contention with uh with language being the way that we arrive at accessing potentiality as the real site of the human um in th this passage where she says uh where sh she writes um speaking here is both process and paradigm to the extent that signifying enables the presence of an absence you, you read a bit of this and registers the absence of a presence but it is also a superior mark of the transformative insofar as it makes something by cutting through the pure and simple of the undifferentiated in the gaps and spacings and signifiers and then this this passage here if potentiality then can be said to be the site of the human rather than the non-human fixedness i actually don't understand that clause to to be honest before the um semicolon more precisely if it is the place of the sub of the subjectivity the condition of being slash becoming subject then its mission is to unfold through words 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 yes but words 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 as they lead us out to the representational where the subject commences its journey in the looking glass of the symbolic so like you like there is no way to remain in in the real it, it seems that you you would be ejected immediately into the symbolic and so i guess i wonder i mean it's there 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 are other things that happen in analysis besides the exchange of language there's there's affect and 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 other things but i'm just i guess curious if 
we are to like not to demand a kind of like reductive takeaway but I'm just curious if you have a sense of where she ends on the question of like language in this um in this essay um I haven't read it nearly as many times as I've read Mama's Baby Papa's Maybe and I feel like I have a clearer sense of 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 uh where you kind of wind up at the end of it with respect to language. And so I guess I'm just curious um, where where you get with that. I, I think that that's a, a really good question. I wonder if one way that she's attempting to resolve it is her reading of this of the account of Samba, where we have this really interesting question of what one can represent of oneself. Right. Um, and so maybe we can think through these two things together. My understanding of that moment where she says um, human fixedness, it is that potentiality is a thing that is fixing the human. Mm -hmm. um, and then with the account of Samba, we have this, um, this tension, right? This, this desire on his part that is claimed that he wants to speak himself to a place, right? That, that he's, he's asking to be, to engage in, in what we might think of as the talking cure. And then that there's a sense that it is impossible for him to under, to, to be able to do that, right? So there's this moment in 722 where he said the, you know, the account is that uh, Samba was regarded as intelligent and sought to verbalize everything he lived, but that there is something beyond discourse. And I, I wonder if mm -hmm. for uh, Spiller's understanding that beyond discourse is this realm of the mythic. It is still within the realm of language, um, but I think that the mythic comes to do a kind of work of the of words, 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 and what goes beyond it. But um, it is also, I think, the, then the question of what is expressed outwards, and then the interiorization, right? That. Samba's desire to speak himself is about an interiorization of guilt, right? It is the emergence of a particular kind of subject, but one that is somehow incoherent within the social world in which he lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think that this is the, the tension, right? Spillers will sort of claim, and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that something of this then translates, right? That part of the transmission and the inheritance of chattel slavery is this, that something that there is an, uh, a frame of intelligibility uh, and a form of discourse that will exceed it because it is not simply the narration of the self, right? It is the narration of, and again, the, the, I, I, to my mind, the, the term that, is the other is 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 myth here mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah that's helpful collective yeah. cultural mm -hmm. you know it, is it like a repository of cultural and collective consciousness i'm not sure but mm -hmm. i think it does a kind of work of uh the thing beyond mm -hmm. yeah that's really helpful thank you Any other uh, questions, um, hands or or chat? Yeah, Alex, go ahead. I wanted to try to pose an answer to the the question about like what happens to the mother um, on page um, seven fourteen. She talks about this moment of um, like being embraced by her father and brother and like experiencing a physical difference in that moment. Um, and then she goes on to say that from that moment on, the imposition of homogeneity and sameness would also be understood um, as the great text of the tradition of race. So like that turn from race to gender I find to be so important and like the biggest revelation for me um, from Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, um, and the specific thing that comes out of the history of chattel slavery, like the pornotropia, um, the like sexualities and genders that are created out of like inhabiting another person's flesh and making them do what you want them to do. 
um and like that that's what happens to the mother is that she's she's like her gender and sex and race it's all like flattened out um everybody is the same it's already answered it's the same the same the same thing that happens um that she's talking about at the beginning of the essay um this question of identity as relates to race like it's a question that's already answered it's fixed um and what psychoanalysis the reason why i think it's a unique intervention is like there are no answers You're you're just coming and there's questions and everything is potential like to be discovered in the future and that's why i have friends who ask like well you have like a white analyst like how can they understand you <laughs> it's like um there's nothing to be like there's just questions it's all to be elucidated um it's like a freedom from or being um a loosening of what has become so fixed and hardened and accreted over time and understood as identity um for for black people yeah i think that, that's like my confused answer as to what has happened to the mother <laughs> I think that's a that's a wonderful answer, and you're actually uh, taking us to a really important thing about this essay. Let's talk about verb tenses here. I'm going to be an English professor in a really intense way, but I think you're really drawing our attention to how important the question of potentiality and fixedness is grammatically, right? Of course, Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe has that amazing uh, subtitle, right? A New American Grammar Book. Um, here also, we're being asked to think about the grammar of becoming or of, uh, of potentiality. And earlier in that same moment that you're drawing our attention to on 713, right? Um, she says that there is a work of discovering where one is at, right? That is the present simple in this moment. Um, and that also there is this extraordinary has always been. So we have two forms of kind of grammatical fixedness. Where we are right now, the question of the future and the question of the past actually entirely uh, set aside and also what has always been in an essay that takes up a subjunctive, right? That is, what could you be? So I, I think that you are absolutely right to draw our attention to the way in which there's a kind of loosening of the fixedness. Um, and I'd love for us to talk more about um, the different moments at which grammar attempts to um, condition a subject into place or into time or into a kind of social relation that is especially for scholars generational. Um, but I also, I want to get your sense and the sense of everybody else here of what we actually make of the violence of that scene, of her flying into her brother and father's. Because just before the moment of this consolidation of, hom of homogeneity, she says, at the very beginning, uh, for example, her father, how her father and brothers bent forward in a grimace when mischievously struck in a certain place above the knees by the little girl. It is a moment of, 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 of violence, right? That like, it is about the moment of an a, encounter with male genitalia, right? And it is framed in, in the question of, of, of sort of intimacy and, and care, but gender there is really important, right? It is her father and brothers grimacing as she plays in this way. So what do we do with that? I mean, yes, the mother is this figure, but what about the little girl? The little girl propelling herself towards her father and brothers in this way. I can respond to that. I also love that in um, 
there's like a parallel question in mama's baby papa's maybe like what's happening to fathers and these absent fathers who aren't there and daughters and like what they could be if they were allowed to be a part of these families that are just mothers and sons um in this like pathological generational tangle that's unthinking like automatically unfolding and she also invokes Barthes and in, in that the mythologies um essay in, in in that as well but for me like what always came up um as I was reading this was camera lucida and like the image the way that he says like death is inscribed at the moment that like a photo is captured it's capturing like um what can never be again like what's definitely not present in front of you is what's captured in a picture in a photo and there's something very similar i think about the way that um gender and race get for this particular ethnic group of um people enslaved here and their descendants that it's almost like a photograph that's frozen that's like this is how this is you forever um and like that's that's death it's it's like a wanted poster like how do i that poster is not me but it's also um predominating over my experience in some way and how do that I is also kind of how I understand the double um I don't know uh yeah Tony maybe you want to add your question and then we can respond to everything well it's, I'm less of a question and more like trying to respond to the question about what's happening in that moment where like the little girl encounters um you know genitalia in this way where she's like accidentally violent or she's like exuberant i mean i'm kind of projecting because it, it immediately reminded me of having similar experiences as a child where my exuberance turns into this violence that like I don't even understand and which is like really kind of overstimulating and um I don't know what exactly Spillers like would say about this I feel like I'm still like in the very beginning of understanding like anything <laughs> that she's saying most of the time but I just like delight in reading her anyway um where like there's there's a um, the way the power function, power and vulnerability are related to each other in that moment, like the the like the juxtaposition of power and vulnerability around like phallic, like phallic symbolism and phallic reality and like the material vulnerability of male genitalia, like the and a little girl being so vulnerable and and like arguably powerless in various ways, but then also capable of like hurting her father with 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 so much ease that it's an accident, like um, also makes me think about the like juxtaposition of power and vulnerability around white supremacy and how whiteness is so, um, uh, what's the word? Like, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, but it falls apart so easily. It's like nothing um, and it exerts so much force and so much violence um, at the same time. So, I don't know. I'm still confused, but that's that's how I think about that moment. I love that you're drawing our attention to this relation between power and vulnerability, because what it is not is a scene of castration, right? It is impossible to imagine that so close as a scene of castration. It is violence and envy and love of a different order. And I think that, you know, thinking about this question of power and vulnerability is so essential to this essay, right? To the way in which uh, in, this, in the account of Samba, part of what is resolved is this sort of question of 
um, an affection and care of another boy, right? The way in which um, what cannot be expressed through like a, through violence actually comes out in all these other ways. And so I think that, you know, the, it's not just the small, you're right that it's not just the small girl who can't actually hurt her brother and fathers in this way. There's, there's also the question of race. There's the question of, of, of what it is, of what kind of violences are available to them already and what kind of violence is also in this essay, she's very keen to protect them from. Right? There's a, a way in which that scene is really beautifully played out as one of like a kind of narrative care too, right? It is, it's exuberance, it's play, it's mischief, but it is, it's really, it tries to strip away so many of the other kind of societal harms and threats that are already available to the body of her father and brothers. Uh, I I have another question. This might be retreading some some of the same ground that we've already covered, but um, just this beginning part of the essay, I find so. I just want to make sure that I understand what she's saying about like the temporality of of critique or the kinds of discourse that that um, enable certain questions to be asked and not others. So like going back to seven eleven, um, like. Uh, she's talking about this, like, like the need for a kind of like boomeranging function um, to account for race and that negation is not enough and like can't uh, accommodate the human as potentiality. Um, but I, I guess my, I'm, I'm just like, Oh, I don't know if I'm trying to put this in terms that are like too simple for the actual structure of the thought, but it like uh, is, I mean, I always read Hortense Spillers as being actually extremely kind of generous to the traditions that she's working with in, in her assessment of their limitations. So like that there is something that is being provided and there are like certain things that are able to be enunciated by virtue of psychoanalytic discourse in particular like you know these scenes from from childhood and these kinds of the way that um uh desire kind of expresses itself but is part of the problem that the like I guess what's confusing to me is that the temporality of the title is like the things you could be if Sigmund Freud's wife were your mother but also like I read her as kind of saying that like psychoanalysis is never really about what could be or so, or like that like could be the con the conditional or the subjunctive of could be never can never actually like give way to will be or can be or something that it like is like fixed in some sort of um conditional horizon where like you don't actually like pause it or you don't actually like um uh I don't know, just that there, that it's like unidirectional in 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 some sort of like um, uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm maybe I'm losing the thread, but I but I I guess I'm trying to understand if she sees the the temporality of psychoanalysis as being structurally unable to accommodate the racial subject or something like that, or the racialized subject. Great question. Um, and I think you are right that what the, subjunct the subjunctive mood does is on the one hand, it is an invitation um, for potentiality, right? This is um, like on, set, on 712 at the top when she says, a break towards the potentiality of becoming or the formation of substitutive identity consists in going beyond what is the given is also exceeding of necessity. So there is the kind of limitless possibility, right? Excess um, that is there. And then there is also fixedness. There is several kinds of fixedness. There's the kind of fixedness of social relations. There's the fixedness of race. And I don't, I think that this essay to my mind is more utopic than 
mama's baby, papa's baby, right? There, it really does open forward into um, the a kind of possibility of becoming. And I, I think of that actually in some ways as the opening invocation of the double. When you send go, it is this idea that you don't, don't know what will become of the substitutive double. And I think somewhere the kind of play of her vision of the snaggle tooth uh, uh, sense, a snaggle tooth replica of her seven year old self carries with it all of the kind of mischief and movement and possibility of her also uh, slamming herself off the roll away bed. There is something about uh, the possible, the potentiality of these substitutive doubles, even as one remains. One remains and one is fixed, um, but there is the possibility of. And otherwise, I, I think for her, that is the that is the utopic possibility of psychoanalysis um, and, I, and, and of language, right, of a, a particular relation to language that is freed from um, givenness, right, as kind of singularity and givenness. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Emily? Yeah, um, I just wanted to follow on that um, because... I think um, I think I also read the Sengo as as uh, as a utopic possibility or a utopic investment in um, the affordances of language or the affordances of of error or mistake or play um, and and I just wanted to add on page um, seven twenty five that the only place really where the the um, the doubling the doubled self reemerges is is this strange um, introduction of the indefinite article when she's thinking about what Samba could possibly be trying to say. So that she writes, "Is it thinkable that a Samba was raising in the depths of his being a question that his culture could not answer, even though the latter had opened the place of the question by giving it its props, its materiality?" Is the quest conditioned by the epistemic choices available to the want to be of the subject? And if the subject overreaches the given discursive conditions, does madness attend? No one quite knowing what he is saying, as indeed was reported to have happened at the onset of Samba's psychotic course. Um, and that indefinite A just really struck me as like the send go of Samba um, and the idea that 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 there's a speculative subject somehow that's coming into being in a, in a self-surpassing of the discourse available. Um, and that she's able to see that in, you know, she's, you know, I think there's a lot of, some, one of the reasons I have trouble reading Spillers is because she's such a, like, depth and a, a depth and adept constant critic of the thing that she's reading that I can't always tell whether she's arguing with or against or like what she's retaining as she's arguing against. Um, and I think, you know, she's flagging in all these ways, like the impossibility of encountering this subject's discourse in this text that is as sort of compromised as it is. Um, but, but even so, the, the, the grounding of the possibility of that send go at the beginning seems like it authorizes her to hear something um, in in Samba's discourse. Absolutely, I mean, I think that moment that you're drawing our attention to, right, is the one at which she also uh, reads what she calls the affect the affecting line, Tutsan espoir, that is everything he hopes. Right or all of his hopes, I think is actually. I'll tell you how bad my French is these days. Um, but that there is something about, and I think the overreach here, she sees as both um, structured by this question of of madness, but also that that is not its totality, right? That there is actually, and this is maybe where it is not as though then he is consigned to some state of utter irreconcilability. In fact, she's drawing in her reading him back into the social, right? This is for her 
the the kind of moment of of something else, right? Where on the one hand, he wants something beyond his life work. And one of the things he seems to want is this this self-narration, right? To be able to give account of oneself. Um, And what it returns to though, is this question of the recognition by brothers. So instead of wanting to give account to oneself as taking us to the scene of castration, it actually takes us to the scene of of sociality, right? And of a a kind of co-filiality, which is much less terrifying. It's much less violent. There is a kind of possibility of of a kind of recuperation or return that I think is really um, that's really important for her in the in the rereading of the Zamba story. Yeah, uh, Alex, I think you had your hand up. Did you decide otherwise? Yeah, I. It's like a half formed thought, but it's kind of responding to um, Patricia's um, comment in the chat and also um, Emily's comment as well, um, that I th- she talks about like, on this is on page 713, um, we might suggest that a different question could come about with the acquisition of a supplemental literacy, one that could be regarded as alien and for that very reason to be learned and pressed into service. like reading in a new way like reading almost as if you're learning how to read for the first time like that's what would be required to apply psychoanalysis to a racialized subject is a reconceiving of a lot that has been already assumed um and then the the question of like what goes beyond um, the question of potentiality on 712. um, It's kind of like a coda to um, what she says about a samba, which I also found really striking, um, a break towards the potentiality of becoming or the formation of substitutive identities consisting consists in going beyond what is given. It is also the exceeding of necessity. So like that, which is like a little too much or going beyond de Cho, that's what's considered him going mad, but it's that's also him. Um, It just can't be contained within the context that he's given. It also can't be understood. It's not intelligible, but um and i think that's the paradigm shift that would need to happen in order to incorporate the race subject into psychoanalysis like um opening up a space where it would be intelligible and not and not too much and are you are you kind of suggesting that the essay performs the first pass at that like in providing Samba recognition or, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Okay, maybe um, Carlin and then we'll take like a five minute uh, break and then break up into um, small groups. Yeah, I just had a curiosity actually about the very end of the essay where she says um, that she kind of wants to unhook the psychoanalytic hermeneutic and decentralize and disperse the knowing one. And I guess maybe in relationship to what we've been talking about, like, is that a question of how psychoanalysis can not only be like applied to the race subject, but what psychoanalysis, like how it would have to change or what like shape it would have to take in order to have space or, or capacity. I was really curious about that dispersal and knowingness and, and I guess also whether or or how that attaches to the question of where the mothers are in this. I I think that these are maybe two comments that speak really beautifully to each other. um, Because I think that what's so interesting about the moment on 713 uh, to 714 that Spillers, when Spillers cites Fennell, part of what she is insisting on is a kind of 
um, not a kind of refusing of the ontological difference of the race subject. That um, someone like Fennel or Samba does not have access to or claim to um, either the edible crisis or the forms of subjectivity to which it claims to give, give rise, right? Instead, she has this really beautiful line on 714 where uh, she says of Fennel, to have admitted that the diasporic African is cut on the bias to the West and not sharply at odds with it would have involved him in a contradiction that his polemic against the West could not abide. So she, Fanon has written himself into a corner that she thinks is not necessary, that the cut on the bias is this lovely way to think about um, an access to being an inheritor of more than one tradition to me to maybe one more than one discursive form. And I wonder if that doesn't help us think through how uh, then we have this uh, decentralized and or the decentralization and the dispersal of the knowing one that you can that actually there's a kind of multiplicity of possibility that's opened up. Um, it also seems and I don't have a, an answer to this um, telling that the multiplicity of possibility she's insisting on is citing Mingus, um, who, of course, is, composes this song, having been diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic. And um, I mean, you should read the Lamar Bruce book, which has this really beautiful account of uh, Mingus's claim that there is a anti-Black uh, psychiatrist who's desperate to give him a lobotomy. Um, and that the, that the, the song actually emerges um, looking to Freud actually as a kind of a uh, way to flee this extraordinary violence of anti-blackness. So I think it is, I, I think it's about a recuperation of uh, multiple traditions that maybe returns us to the subjunctive. Freud may be your father. He may be a loving or withholding stepfather or someone to which you have, he ha who has no affiliation to you and yet you are still citing in the what you might be. Right, that all of these relations and non-relations to Freud give rise to different possibilities sent out, the send goes, right? Sent off into the world and that then engage different relations to the social order and the question of race in particular. Great. Um, thanks so much, Plomi, and thanks everyone for uh, your questions. I think uh, Sophie will get to um, yours and other uh, comments in the chat um, on the other side of small groups. So we'll take a five minute break, um, come back around 205 and then do small groups for, yeah, maybe uh, like 35 minutes, 40 minutes, and then come back and maybe 35. So we have time for questions that come up in small groups and then we'll return. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we'll return now to uh, questions for Palomi um, or or for others. Um, I know there were some things that came up in my breakout room that maybe we could um, post to the group, but any questions, you can raise your hand or type in the chat. Um, All right, I'll, I'll maybe just start with a very broad uh, question, which was just returning a little bit to this idea of the um, essay being a bit more utopian than um, Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe. I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more about where you read that. I mean, we, we talked a lot about the kind of tenses and the, and the um, temporality of the essay, but I'm curious, uh, yeah, where, where you locate the utopic or utopian. Yeah, I, you know, actually listening in the breakout room is so useful for me um, because I think I had fixed my my own gaze uh, too firmly on mama's baby, papa's maybe as the thing to which Spillers is responding. And I think that like when I thought back about what is utopic about this essay, I actually think it is a, a really um, intentional and beautiful attempt to um, to recuperate a number of possible inheritors of Freud. Um, and one is like a kind of repair of the, the sort of like violence, the violent 
inscription and enfleshment of the subject from uh, Mama's baby. But I was also thinking about how at the end, she comes to this moment, she says, I didn't see it coming, but I agree with Mel. Uh, and um, that there is this really interesting, uh, uneasy relation, I would call it maybe even like sibling, Mm -hmm. like relation to Fanon at the end, um, as she then populates this uh, horizontal filiality with also Mingus, and that we have kind of three uh, yous in the title that are returned, um, mm -hmm. and they each have a different relation, both to Freud, uh, to the mother who may be Freud's wife, um, and I actually think that the way that maybe she does it most intensely is, is through this question of the gaze, that what she is doing by suggesting a, a form of gaze that is not violent, that is actually subject forming um, and kind of cohering and is aspirational and does not evoke uh, the terror of castration. Uh, she's very gently handing back to Fanon his moment of racial subjectivity. Right, which in black skin, white mask is that moment that he returns to over and over again, where uh, a young child looks at him and says, look, mama, a Negro, I'm frightened. Mm. But actually, look, mama, a Negro, I'm frightened, is really different than the moment that she talks about in her reading of Samba, right? Where uh, on 727, uh, she says the child felt empowered by the father, loved by the father. When, when he was well-dressed by him, when he imagined others looking at him well-dressed. That in fact, here's a subject who is, um, the subject of the gaze who is actually cohered and, um, and held in place. I mean, again, it's like a turn to the communal and the cultural, but I do think it is a way to, um, to give something back to these other inheritors of Freud who found themselves maybe not seeing the subjunctive mood as one of possibility, but actually of confinement. And um, of, I mean, for Fanon, of like a kind of violent enfleshment, right, of blackness. But so I, I think that that's, this is, I mean, and very much um, something I'm still thinking through because it, it really, I hadn't thought of it fully enough until the, until the breakout room. So, but I think that that is part of the possibility. It's also, I, I think, a recuperation of psychoanalysis more generally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You don't have to be fixed by the givenness of the Oedipal crisis. Um, that, in fact, as she ends, um, she says, what does she say? Uh, I have lost the page. Um, but she says that what it actually seems to offer is an ethical self knowing, right? that unhooks the psychoanalytic hermeneutic from its rigorous curative framework. So that actually when we loosen our sense that we can know by virtue of these structures, that there's a different kind of uh, self-knowing that's possible. Great, thank you so much. Other questions? Yeah, Alex, of course. Um, Pumi, you, you mentioned that there is another um, version of the essay that, and also I noticed there is a footnote that, that mentions this is a, a, like a shorter excerpt of a longer piece. I'm wondering if you know if the longer piece discusses in more detail the um, something that she sort of hints at this difference between what she calls a continental American black people and um, the diaspora and what the significance of those differences, like she doesn't really expound on that in this essay, but um, it, yeah, was just very interesting. I'm wondering if the longer piece actually does get into that more a little. I mean, the, the longer piece really also takes up the sort of question of, of what psychoanalysis has to say about race as it is, rather than doing this sort of, here is an example of the way in which 
um, a particular case study tells us about a, a psychoanalytic reading. Um, uh, that essay is really interested in the sort of psychoanalytic subject um, a, as a raced one. Um, it is, I, you know, it's so, I think it's also so interesting that she writes these two versions of the essay in the same year, that like there's a way in which um, she knows she's going to correct and expound, but she has to, she has to say this first. Um, and I, I, some people have written about the two essays together, but um, there's, and the fact that also she insists on the same title is a really interesting, again, like creating of a kind of um, communality between uh, these two. They become siblings to each other, um, telling very different stories, but like insisting on the same kind of uh, inheritance. Yes, and doubles, exactly, a double to each other. Um, but I will also say the other essay is like 70 pages long. <laughs> So it's it is a uh, it's like a really um, it's a, it's a big intervention in all of, in um, all sorts of ways. Other questions? Uh, Palomi, I was wondering if you wanted to say a little bit more. We talked about this a little bit in the breakout room, and and you touched on it in in your present your wonderful presentation as well. But I, uh, yeah, I guess because the seminar has been rather obsessed, I guess, with the question of family and and psychoanalysis. I, I was I was wondering if maybe since we're toward the end here, maybe we can hear you talk a little bit about kinship and a little bit about you know, non edifalized kinship and, and, and these all these more heterogeneous forms of family that might come out of this text. Yeah, I, you know, I think it is so interesting that this essay, which cites parents in its title is in fact about co-filiality, right? It is about, um, about siblings and about brothers and, and their, I do think that, you know, often psychoanalysis gives us this real investment in, in parents and in, uh, in fixed structures uh, that I'm, I'm myself always obsessed. And I, like, I feel like every class I teach, I have to like spend a lot of time talking about the moment of the, the primal horde, you know, and this, the, the way in which there is, it is an ethical, act right to 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 not just kill the father but to to take the father into themselves right that there is this creation of not just blood guilt but actually a kind of um reconstitution of a social body uh that is shared in which the love and fear and the father and the and the power of the father are then redistributed um and that is it that is utopian in its own way right it imagines this possibility of of a kind of uh horizontal sociality um, that is not fully untroubled by something like rivalry, but is like agreed uh, by virtue of, of the taboo to, to, to distance um, from it. And here, I think because she, she does something so interesting where she says, but rivalry remains. Right, she's not. She's not giving up on the really naughty structures of intimacy and um, and what kinship actually does. That rivalry doesn't go away. Uh, aggressive uh, fantasies don't go away, but they come to take on a new form. And one way is the disposition of the double. Right, that um, Samba's dev devil is not this figure of the second order, right? The, the figure of demons and, and jinns. But in fact, the only way he can really contend with his own aggressive and um, affiliative instincts towards a boy like himself, um, that like, there, that she opens up a new way to think about the complications of kinship that, um, that can't do away with the reality of of the aggressive instinct of, of the complications of power, right? To go back to the question that seems to have been raised, I think really um, sharply. Yeah, 
Yeah, thanks. I, I also really appreciate that as this is um our final session and it it helps, I think, uh move into the next um seminar as well a little bit to to think about that. Um any other questions to ask for me? I had one that's my, it could be um, fairly, the response could be straightforward, but also maybe not because it's fillers. But um, I was just wondering, uh, I just feel very um, fixated on the on the use of the, the term life worlds. And I was wondering if that is, if she's drawing on something specifically there that you know of, or is referring, I, like, what did you make of that term? How is, what is it doing for her? And is it even worth fixating on like I am or something like that is my question. I, I, you're, I think you're right. I mean, the question, uh, you, you know the answer in that there's both a simple answer and then there's like the spillers answer. I think the simple answer is um, life world is the term that she gets out of anthropology. Um, and it's her way of engaging um, the, the anthropological discourse of the um, the um, Oribex. But um, she's doing something else, right? Because like in anthropology, life world is um, the set of social relations that aren't just about um, kinship and structures between the living, but also uh, nature with the spirits, a whole um, populated uh, cultural uh, context. Um, but I think it is also her way of really playing with time in an interesting way to, and, and generationality um, that by evoking life world, she's also trying to think about family and kinship beyond just um, the, the structure of the nuclear family and the Oedipal crisis, but a multi-generational crisis that is actually um, inaugurated in many ways by chattel slavery and the violence of um, of extracting people from not just that life world, but also um, refusing to have them incorporated within another, right? This is the other um, thing I think that like she's trying to think through. It is not as though um, blackness is given a compensation in psychoanalysis. And she, I think she's trying to think through what else there is and she wants to think of um, the multiplicity and the potentiality. Um, but it is it is the violence, not just of taking, but of excluding, of saying that this is not a structure, a social or a individual structure of subjectivity for you, right? That this is you know, the discourse of colonial psychoanalysis, it is the discourse of um, all kinds of structures and medicalization, um, that it is that we that all you have is pathology that one of the things that race uh, gives in, in lieu of any other kind of um, hermeneutic structure is the structure of madness. Um, so uh, I, I think that that's part of the really complicated stuff that she's alluding to uh, when she uses the word life worlds. Thank you, that's really helpful. Any other final questions? I'll, I'll say um, that I think this is really a beautiful way of ending the seminar, in part because I think more than any other author we've read, uh, Horton Spillers is very deeply attuned to the uh, profound limits of psychoanalysis and its necessity in a future in the possibility of a future. And that the kind of complexity and contradictions of that, I think your talk really drew out quite beautifully. And uh, the essay itself, I think, tackles in a way that is um, so crucial to try to help us think. 
Yeah, I, I agree and have struggled with this essay before and you really opened it up and made it available. So thank you so much for um, taking the time to talk to us and for, uh, yeah, closing closing this out on such a really um, kind of, uh, I don't know, the, yeah, I, I think that the, the ambivalence of, of the essay um, was handled with so much care and, and possibility and critique. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll keep that going in the next session and, um, or, or the next seminar. And um, everyone's of course, very welcome to, to sign up for that one as well. We'll be in touch um, over the mailing list. Um, well, we have all of your emails, so we'll, we'll be in touch about um, further programming and, um, thank you so much, Plomi. Thank you, Emmy. Thank you to all the facilitators. Thank you so much to the participants. It's like unbelievable to see these faces every other Sunday. It's been so um, sustaining and amazing uh, to to think with you all. And hopefully the community can kind of uh, continue to coalesce around the magazine and, and other talks and events. And yeah, it's, it, I'm just, I'm just so grateful. Um, I feel like I want to give everyone a, a chance to speak and say something, but um, definitely keep in touch. And I, I know I speak for the other editors and saying um, that these conversations were so important and informative in the uh, preparation of the first issue and um, yeah we're just invaluable so thank you um, and yeah it's kind of hard to say goodbye but uh, I'm sure I'm sure we'll see oh also there's going to be um, for those of you who are in New York there will be a little release party on um, December 16th at St. Mark's Church the Poetry Project um, we'll send out an email to the the um, mailing list that we have for this seminar um to let you all know about that and then in early january there will be a release party in the bay area as well so pull me if if you want to go to that one um and maybe maybe in some other locations as well depending on where people are so definitely just be in touch and um thank you so much thank you thank you all this has been such fun and all, all the videos are online so if you need to revisit any particular moment of of the seminar you can most of them are online yeah thank you so much